Thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, as Mauro said, I'm a, um, a senior editor at Nature Communications, and this is uh, basically the view from my office. We have an office in uh, New York, obviously, as you can see, the Statue of Liberty. Um, and as Mauro already told you, uh, my background is quite diverse. I graduated from um, uh, the University of Belgrade in molecular biology and physiology, and then I moved to Mauro's lab, and I did my PhD with Mauro. Uh, identifying human origins of replication. Uh, and then he sent me to a conference in Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, so I actually went to New York, uh, fell in love with that city, and decided to go there and pursue um, my career there, where I ended up in uh, Dan Rifkin's lab, working actually on cell biology and TGV beta. Um, that was intended. What actually happened was that, as Mauro mentioned, I'm, I made a knockout mouse. Actually, I made and analyzed several of them. They all, all had cardiovascular uh, defects, so I started studying cardiovascular system and heart development in particular, and then um, I stayed with Dan for a number of years and became a faculty member at NYU, and then I moved to Mount Sinai studying molecular mechanisms of aortic aneurysm, so cardiovascular uh, research. And then I joined uh, Nature Communications in 2014 as an associate editor, and ever since I've been uh, handling cardiovascular, uh, papers on cardiovascular regeneration, uh, physiology and disease. Um, and when I started, we were a smaller team. I was one of the first editors hired uh, in New York, um, in the New York office. I handled also other subjects because uh, due my, during my uh, tenure at NYU, I actually studied other s organ systems such as lung, uh, kidney, and so on. Uh, so this is just to let you know that um, you never know where your career or where your project will take you. So you might start, as I did, as a molecular bi biologist and then, then end up with molecular pathology. Um, you never know, but it, it was a great experience, and it's very, very useful for what I do now um, in reading and handling papers. So um, I guess you're all familiar with this uh, structure. Uh, I work for Nature Communications, but, and we belong to the Nature family of journals, uh, which has some sort of a pyramidal organization. As you can see, we have, a, do I have a pointer here? Yeah. We have Nature uh, on, at the top. And then uh, we have nature research journals uh, in the middle, middle tier. And then uh, at the bottom, or as I prefer to look at it, at the base of this pyramid, we have nature communications. So uh, there are differences between these journals in selectivity and in the impact of the, the papers studies published uh, in these different journals, and also amount of copy editing that we put in um, every, every paper. Um, my journal is open access only, and uh, we uh, tend to publish a lot of uh, articles. We don't have any, any sort of uh, limit uh, as to how many papers we can publish per day, week, year. We publish whatever we uh, deem to be, uh, you know, good, uh, solid, and Im impactful science, so uh, we uh, handle more papers than uh, um, average uh, editor at other research journals. So that's the reason why we put a little bit less effort into copy editing. Anyway, so what makes a nature paper? I guess you already uh, more or less know that only reports uh, that um, show the most significant advances and have the widest applications and can be read by anyone, meaning a biology paper can be read and understood by a physicist. So something that has a very broad impact is published in Nature. Um, as, as I said, significance should be readily appreciated by non-specialists. Um, uh, Nature also publishes uh, certain types of papers that uh, provide significant uh, resource value or technical breakthrough or translational potential. So it's not just 
uh, really complete studies with several uh, animal models, uh, the me molecular mechanism completely worked out, all the alternatives uh, completely worked out. Uh, nature is also interested in, in papers like, like this. Uh, but what if um, uh, there is an important advance in, in, a, in your study, but perhaps it's not really meant to be, uh, it, it's not reaching uh, uh, people that are outside of your, your, uh, your field, uh, but are very important for your particular field and can be appreciated by any biologist or any life, science, uh, life sciences uh, uh, scientist. So in that case, uh, perhaps you are better off submitting your paper to nature research journals. Uh, and we have many of them. Since uh, the mid um, or early 80s, uh, nature journal, well, nature uh, family of journals has been growing rapidly. And you, you can see here only some examples of nature research journals that we have now. There are many more, and there are many more to come. Um, I'm really happy to announce that in 2018, we are going to launch Nature Metabolism, um, which would be uh, especially for the fields that I cover, cardiovascular and some metabolism, which would be, I think, a very important addition to our family of journals. Um, what makes a Nature Research Journal paper? As I mentioned before, uh, these are uh, really exceptional papers that uh, report the most significant advances within the discipline that it covers. The uh, signif uh, significance of these papers can be readily appreciated by non-specialists. But what if, we, if you have a paper uh, that uh, is a very good paper uh, and uh, it reports uh, very important advances in specialist areas of research, but the, uh, the appeal is preferentially to the specialist in that area. Uh, so, in that case, you might want to submit your paper to us. Uh, as I said, uh, Nature Communications is a uh, fully open access journal. It's online only. It's fully open access since 2014. Uh, it's multidisciplinary, so we publish life sciences papers and as well physical sciences papers. So basically, our scope is very similar to that of Nature. It just um, a tier, a couple of tiers below nature. Um, we do not have any journalistic content. There are no research, <coughs> excuse me, highlights or news and views. Um, but we have a huge team of editors that are dedicated to uh, a very, very specialist uh, areas. So, uh, or as myself, I cover only cardiovascular at the moment, blood biology and cardiovascular research. So at the moment, we are 68. Uh, we are soon to be 100. And it's the biggest team uh, within Nature, Journal, uh, fam Nature Journal's family. We have three offices, uh, one in London. That's our main office. Well, still. Um, and then in 2014, we have opened an office in, in, Lon in uh, New York. Uh, that's where I um, work. Uh, we were only three in <coughs> April 2014 when I joined. Now we are 14. And we have offices in Shanghai. And uh, the view from the Shanghai office is very similar to the view that I just showed you on my first slide, just without the Statue of Liberty. Uh, so yeah, <coughs> we uh, are spread on three different con uh, continents. Um, our impact factor uh, in 2015 was 1130, well, still is 1133. Uh, it's stably around this number for, a couple of, uh, for the last couple of years. We publish daily, and just to let you know how much is that, uh, in 2015, we received 22,000 papers, published 3,500 of them which means that we have an uh, acceptance rate of about 15%, which is um, from my personal communication with the different editors and meetings, I think the highest uh, acceptance rate uh, that any journal has. Um, and I think the reason for that is the fact that we are open access in um, online journals, so we can really publish whatever we think it's, it's right. We don't have any limitations in, in space. Uh, we work really hard. And uh, now we are uh, also <laughs> many. So uh, I think that's, that's the, the secret of this high number of uh, acceptance rate and published papers. So what are we 
uh, after. So what do we uh, look for? Uh, new ideas, new insights, new technologies, the usual stuff. Um, and of course, uh, what, what's very important for us is that the, the data is of a high quality and that's, that the paper is technically sound. Um, basically, we look forward to, uh, we, we look for uh, papers that will excite your research community. So uh, many people in my uh, encounters with uh, authors and researchers, uh, they, they've heard of us, but they still do not know what our scope is and how we work. So uh, since we are open access and online journal, they uh, immediately think that we are like plus one, meaning that we can publish anything that is technically sound. N that's not true. We uh, look for conceptual novelty, extent of scientific advance, completeness, and as a disease editor, as they usually call me in my team, um, we look for physiological relevance, uh, relevance to disease, uh, mechanistic insight, and importance or usefulness of, of, of the study uh, being reported. So uh, we look for important advances that are of interest to specialists in their field. That's uh, in a nutshell. So uh, if you want to submit your, journal, uh, su submit your paper and you are still indecisive where to go, um, there is no really a uh, secret formula what would be the best place uh, or the best home for your paper, but um, you should perhaps step uh, back and look at your work um, with different, li objectively, let's say, and uh, perhaps uh, start to think about journals that you regularly read and you more or less know uh, what those journals uh, publish. So that's how you know where certain journals bar is, so where your study can <coughs> be a good fit. Um, it is very important uh, that, that uh, the, the research questions and the data are basically the key to your um, uh, choice of, of, of uh, the, um, uh, the, the journal where you wanna, want to submit. So, I just want to introduce you to this uh, other option that uh, uh, the family, Nature Journal family offers, and that is the um, so-called so, so mega journal option uh, as a plus one. Uh, basically, we have a, a journal that is called Scientific Reports uh, with a pretty high impact factor, which is around 5.5. It's an open access online only uh, journal that publishes really a huge amount of papers and uh, um, they are not really after uh, novelty and, and significance. A lot of paper that are really technically solid, if people get scooped, which happens every day, this perhaps uh, would be a good option for, uh, I hope that won't happen to you, but I'm just saying uh, this journal has a, a, a very good reputation, a solid impact factor, and uh, they care about technical correctness, uh, that the paper is technically correct and solid, but they don't really uh, emphasize the novelty and significance of, of the work. So I just wanted to give you a, a taste. This is something that I do occasionally. Um, we have this thing called master classes where we try to uh, help especially young researchers and uh, uh, PhD students and postdocs in how to write a paper, how to approach uh, to writing a paper. So uh, I'm sure that many of you do not really need this, but some people find it useful. So uh, when you write a paper, uh, there are several very, very simple rules. And uh, one of them is explain, don't hype. And another one is show, don't tell. Which means basically uh, be very brief, concise, accurate, and do not oversell your work. That's a really b big sort of, uh, um, no one likes it. The editors do not like it, the uh, referees do not like it. We know that you're excited about your work, but you should be realistic and uh, do not really hype. Show, that means uh, we want to see your results. We want to see all of them. Uh, you can uh, have them in your main uh, text, you can have them in the supplementary data, but for example, in my journal, data not shown is a big no-no. So we want to see your results. So please show, show them all, show all of them that are pertinent to, uh, to your story. Um, you should be uh, focused, so uh, you should have in mind before you start writing what is the one most important thing about your study uh, and uh, what is the take-home message um, about your study. 
Uh, you should also be aware of the significance of your work and how does it fit in the context of what's known about uh, the subject that you work on. So uh, you have to be aware. Uh, the, the best thing to actually write, I think, an introduction is to provide um, a, a short history, not history, but a short overview of the, of, of the literature uh, that sets the stage for your own work. And then the crucial point is to identify the gap in knowledge, so what hasn't been shown so far, and how your paper actually contributes to the field, and what burning issue it resolves, or uh, what advance it brings. So uh, we like to think that uh, writing a paper is really simple. Uh, you should just stick to these three rules. The ABC of writing, which means accurate, brief, and clear. But from my personal experience, that's really, really rare. Um, so what does accuracy mean? I've given here an example of an abstract that uh, this is an abstract of a paper that I published. So it is a very, very nice paper, uh, but this is an excerpt from, uh, from the um, abstract. So when I say accuracy, I mean, I mean this. So we really, uh, si if something is really significantly um, better than other things, it, that's not something you want in, in your abstract. You want hard facts, you want numbers, and you want something really accurate. Uh, this is another uh, example of, of brevity, so uh, this complicated sentence can be said really simply like this. So you, you should use as few words as possible and uh, uh, be very, very concise. Um, as for clarity, I think that's the, 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 the most difficult thing to explain. I've seen papers where English is perfect, but the paper is completely unclear. Um, on the other hand, I've seen papers where English is really bad, uh, but the paper, you can, you can follow the logic of the paper. The construction, the structure of the paper is really, really good. And there is a strong logic. And then the, the way that the, the, the writer uh, leaves you, uh, leads you through, through their story is really uh, simple, logical, and easy to follow. So that's much more important than the quality of your English for all of us. Most of us, as myself, we are actually not, uh, English is not our first language. So don't get discouraged. Um, for, for some time, I thought that was, my, th that was the main issue, uh, why I, sh I could not become an editor. It's absolutely not an issue. Um, what, what we need from you is the way you think, uh, your scientific background, uh, the, your, your gift uh, to, to assess your own work and then uh, the work of others and put it in, in the context of what, what's known. So that's what, we, that's what we are after when we hire people, not really the quality of your English. Of course, if you have a, a, a beautiful English, that's a big plus. But um, going back to clarity, uh, this is, I think, something that's a really, really uh, a gift and uh, not many people are uh, able to, to write really clear. So you should not use uh, jargon. Many, uh, that, that's, I think, my main issue with, uh, with papers that come especially from Europe when people speak really good English and then write a paper in a way that um, it gives me a headache, so it needs a lot of, a lot of uh, corrections. Um, these are maybe uh, more uh, grammar issues, but uh, I think uh, the, the most important thing is to have a very clear uh, structure of your paper. So what, as I said, uh, give us a little bit of the background, identify the gap in knowledge, Tell us why your study is important. How does it fill in that gap in knowledge? And then uh, do not put your experiments in a chronological order, but in order that makes sense. So that when I read the story, I, I can actually uh, appreciate the, the significance of your work easily. So I know that that's difficult to explain, but I'm sure that you have at least one great teacher here, and that's Mauro Jaka, who, who can write papers really, really uh, great. So. Submission. Um, when you submit your paper, uh, you've written it and you, you follow the ABCs of uh, writing, um, we want you to submit a cover letter. And many people think that's a useless exercise. Actually, it's not. We do read it. And it's your 10 minutes with, with the editor. So uh, imagine 
you're pitching your paper to me and you're saying, I have this great study and you know, this hasn't been shown, uh, this is not known, uh, or there is a controversy in the field. So we've shown this. So tell me about your paper in very, very few sentences. Just give me a digest of your paper. And that's what I like to, to, to read in, in the cover letter. Sometimes the cover letters I find much more informative than, than the paper itself. Um, and we, we all read it, so uh, you should, it's not just a useless exercise and you should not just say in the cover letter, this uh, paper has not been submitted, submitted elsewhere and all the authors approved the content, which I find quite frequently. I would like you to tell me why are you excited about that, your paper, um, what is in your paper, in your own words, not, you know, broken into paragraphs in the results and the discussion. I just need a paragraph, sell, sell your paper to me. So I like reading, we all read uh, cover letters. Uh, we also s encourage you to put referee suggestions. Do not put, of course, your uh, mentor, or your friends, your relatives. Uh, be realistic <laughs> and objective. Uh, people that you think would really have the expertise to assess your paper. Um, also, if, you ha if there is any possible conflict of interest and you, uh, there are people that you want to exclude, uh, we always, always, always respect that. Uh, but, of course, do not exaggerate. Like, I have sub had submissions with people who would uh, exclude 20 people, which is really excessive. Basically, anyone who could disagree with them. So, <laughs> if there are any uh, papers that... Um, your, your own papers or um, uh, papers that are in some way connected to the study that's been submitted to us or to any journal, you have to identify those papers in the uh, cover letter and most probably the editors would ask you to uh, submit those papers as well so that they can see the content and uh, see if there is any uh, overlap or uh, they might even ask you to send both papers to the referees just to see, uh, to have a, a more, equi um, more balanced uh, assessment of, of the paper that's submitted to us. So uh, take some time when writing your cover letter. Uh, it's pretty important and it can do you really good uh, if it's writ written in a, in a nice way. So. All this and more you can actually get from these master classes that uh, my company organizes on invitation, of course. If you're interested, uh, it's a whole day sort of lecture. Uh, it's usually two editors that work for Nature Journal's uh, family. Uh, I've, done it se I've done several of them. Uh, I was coupled with one Nature editor, uh, the Angela Egelhart, who covers biochemistry and uh, Nature Methods uh, editor who covers, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I I'm just saying uh, uh, we are sent in couples from different journals with different background and for eight hours you will get basically lessons on how to uh, write a paper, um, what happens when you submit your paper, what is our job. The, whole, the goal is that uh, we uh, would try to help you and teach you how to improve your chances to write a good paper that can be uh, eventually accepted wherever you decide to send it. So if you're interested in this, uh, you can contact this person here or contact me. I'll, I'll just uh, forward your <coughs> information, your interest. So uh, I think this is more interesting for you. Uh, what, is, what happens after submission? Um, many people, m myself included, uh, I didn't know really what happens on the other side before I became um, an editor myself. So uh, you usually write your paper and submit and then you get the editorial decision which can be peer review, which is good news, um, or it can be returned to the author or rejected. Um, in my journal, we usually send out between 25 and 30 percent of papers. My uh, personal um, stati statistics is 27. Uh, that's quite a lot, um, especially um, that we have also a lot of submissions, so that's quite a lot, a lot of papers uh, being sent out. We take risks. Uh, as I said, we are not as selective as Nature and uh, Nature Research Journal. So if we find value in the paper, if we like it, and we are completely aware that it's too preliminary, it doesn't really have everything that we would need to be published, we take risks. And uh, that means we send it out uh, and we more or less know what the referees will 
tell us. But we like the story, we like the idea, so uh, that's why we have this sort of high number of papers being sent out for peer review. So as I mentioned, uh, 25 to 30 percent of them uh, go to um, peer review. So what, what is it that we do? We read the paper and uh, uh, we get back to you uh, within a week. Uh, that's sort of what we aim for, but as I said, there are some periods that are very busy and that might be longer um, or sh even shorter when the, 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 the period is good. Uh, at least one editor will assess the paper thoroughly, so if, it, if paper is on cardiovascular, it will come to me, and I will definitely read it and make comments, but then I usually consult, especially if the paper is uh, involving other elements, will consult with someone else in my team. So uh, Nature Communications is organized in smaller teams. My team is Metabolism and Physiology, uh, we are six editors and we all work on metabolism and physiology. We have two Italian editors that uh, handle liver, pancreas, muscle, gene therapy, bone. Uh, we have one Australian editor that handles immunology and uh, also some bone. Uh, a Chinese, well, Taiwanese editor who handles immunology. Um, I'm, I don't really know what I am, but originally from Serbia, handling cardiovascular. So we're an international team and we handle all these uh, different areas of physiology and uh, disease. And our team manager uh, handles obesity and uh, metabolism, he's German. So the whole journal is organized in small teams that basically can be even seen as independent journals, even though we do collaborate ex extensively, but that's the size of, I don't know, JCI, for example, or even Nature Medicine. They don't have much, I, the number of editors they have is very similar to what we have in our own team. So that's how we work. So at least one editor will assess the paper and then uh, usually consult with someone else as well, and then we make a decision. Let's continue with this paper. Oh, we don't think this is, uh, this is, this has reached our bar, so we send our first decision to the uh, authors. Uh, if we send your paper out for peer review, you will get an automated message from us, uh, email, um, that says your paper has been sent to peer review, uh, but that doesn't mean that we already have all the editor, all the referees assigned, and that creates a lot of uh, misunderstandings with our, our, our authors because when they get that email, they think, oh, they already have all three referees, and the paper has been already sent to uh, our peers for, for review. No, that means that we just made a decision to send it out. Sometimes it takes us uh, days, even weeks, to find uh, appropriate um, referees. As I mentioned, uh, 20 to 40 percent. This depends on the area. In my area, it's around 30 percent um, of manuscripts are sent out to review, and we usually engage with two to four referees per paper. I have had examples when we had five, but that's because we, uh, we really uh, take good care that all the technical aspects of the paper are, are being assessed by uh, experts. So if you have, if you have employed uh, single cell RTPC transcriptomics, for example, and that's really um, many, many results that you uh, then presented uh, in your paper are based on that particular technique, we will have someone who does not necessarily have to have experience, say, in cardiovascular, but uh, knows the technique really well so that he or she can tell us if uh, technically your, the, the basis of your paper is solid. So we will engage with uh, uh, referees that are there only for technical purposes, in addition to referees that actually can see the big picture and can see the, the, the advance that your study provides in your particular field. So how do we select reviewers? Uh, broad knowledge of the field, as I mentioned. They have to have technical expertise as well. Fair and constructive, but this comes with experience, uh, and this is, uh, the list of fair and constructive referees that we all keep uh, is really precious and when an, a ref, when a, an, an editor leaves uh, the company or the journal, this is something that we all want uh, because that means you, know, you, can, uh, you can go back to people that know where the bar of your journal is that are fair and constructive because uh, quite often we got, get these reports that are perhaps poor, short, or just not, you know, involved or, or objective, which is, of course, creates a, a problem uh, for us, uh, but for, 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 for the authors, uh, mostly for the authors. So 
coming to a decision sometimes can be really a difficult task if uh, the reports that we received are not really uh, great. We also like uh, efficient uh, referees. We all know that you as researchers are very busy, sometimes too busy, sometimes it takes, we usually ask people to return their comments in 10 days. Uh, that rarely happens. Uh, so efficiency means please you know, be punctual and give us your report on time. So uh, if the, the editorial decision is late, that usually means, not that editor is sitting you know, on their butt and doing nothing, that one or several reports are really, really late or we had difficulties recruiting referees. Um, of course, availability, it's very nice if you, uh, if you it, it, it's fine if you decline our invitation, just let us know. Um, I can't do this uh, because I'm traveling until, I don't know, December 1st, would that be okay with you if I deliver my report December 2nd? And I, in many, many occasions I say yes, because I prefer to wait longer than 10 days and have a report from someone that I really, really appreciate and I know that it, uh, that person can deliver a good report. That's good for authors as well. This is, I think, very hard to explain to the authors, uh, and, and I, I try that very hard at, at conferences, because sometimes waiting is better than getting a really, really fast decision, because you might actually get a really good set of referees assessing your paper that will be very constructive and, and you know, help you actually get into our journal and help you improve your paper than something really fast and perhaps not, not that good. So uh, what we ask from our referees is technical assessment uh, that uh, all these things basically are listed, uh, how, uh, the, uh, if the conclusions are experimentally supported, uh, what's the general quality of the data, are there uh, all proper controls included, uh, what are the standards in the field, did they use the uh, proper techniques to assess certain aspects of, of the study. And they, of course we ask for their editorial assessment uh, what is the advance of the study and uh, what would be the impact of, on the field of that study? So uh, recently we have started this double blind peer review uh, at uh, MPG and our journal in particular. Not all, not all of them are, not all nature research, well, nature family journals are doing it. We are. Uh, so when you submit at the uh, point of submission, you will be asked, if you want to opt in for a double blind peer review, which means that we then need uh, some extra work from you, you should remove, of course, the names of the authors uh, from the cover page and um, referrals like as we've shown in our previous studies, X does Y, that needs to get, you know, needs to be changed because that way you reveal your identity. If you really want to be anonymous, you have to rewrite your paper in a certain way. But many people actually opt in for, for, for this. Um, usually labs that are not well established, uh, I think that they feel uh, that their chances are increased if, they are not, if their identity is not known. Um, and I have to say that it works pretty well. Uh, we haven't had any, uh, I haven't heard any referees saying, I don't want to re review this paper because it's, uh, uh, that the author is an anonymous, no. Uh, and we've, we've have the, uh, I've had personally several very good papers that were reviewed in this way, submitted as a, and reviewed as double uh, blind peer review. In my personal experience, they mostly come from Asia. Uh, I think people from Asia feel this uh, uh, bias uh, that, you know, they perhaps do not do uh, such stringent science. This is what I heard from China, for example. I'm not trying to be, uh, and I know it's not true. We, we get really a lot of uh, Chinese submissions, and we've published a lot of very good Chinese papers. Um, but I'm just saying uh, some uh, communities perhaps feel this pressure that there is bias in their communities, so they prefer to uh, submit this way. And uh, in my personal experience, it works really well. If you don't want this, you just have to say no, and the, the referees will be uh, will know who who uh, is behind your study. So decisions uh, after re review. Um, this I think uh, was supposed to go after this uh, slide. So um, never mind. Um, when we send your paper out for peer review, and we get all the reports back, 
So we read them all, uh, but we don't count votes. As I explained previously, some referees are there just because we want them to assess the, the technical parts of, of the paper. And if they say this, this study makes a huge impact in the field, well, we take that with a grain of salt because their field might not be cardiovascular, but something else. So uh, I often get comments, uh, why did you reject my paper? Because uh, two out of three uh, referees uh, really like my study and this referee who is negative is actually wrong and stuff like that. But we uh, base our decision uh, on, you know, we don't put uh, equal weight on ed each and every report. So we usually have one or maybe two key referees in, in, in the trio or maybe there will be two or, f or four. And uh, that person has perhaps the best view of the field, of the, the community basically, and uh, can tell us, uh, you know, not just the technical points of your paper, if, if, the, if the conclusions of your paper are uh, supported by the data, but also the level of the advance and things like that. So the bottom line is um, we do not count votes. So uh, two positive, one negative doesn't mean your paper will, we will continue with your paper and the other way around. Um, and uh, we can overrule uh, reviewers and we do that quite often. And the, the, our job is not just, you know, to summarize the reports and uh, to make a decision, okay, um, as I said, two were negative, one is positive, so that's, I think, a no. No, uh, first of all, we know, uh, we, 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 as I said, put different weight to each report. And then uh, we, uh, we know the field and we've been doing research for quite some time, so we all actually still know, uh, you know, the techniques and everything. So sometimes we know that referee perhaps is wrong. Um, and in those cases, we consult with other referees if possible. We even include a new uh, referee asking specific questions. So what do you think about this comment? Uh, do you think it's justified? If you do, uh, can you please explain why? And things like that. So again, if you do not hear back from us, and it's been 40 days since you submitted your paper, calm down. Uh, contact the, the editor. We will try to explain what the situation is, but it might be complicated. We might be, uh, and we don't really want to update you uh, after each and every email because it may get confusing. Uh, so uh, we are trying to figure out, you know, uh, what's the best way to proceed. So sometimes it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of thinking. And then, as I said, we are on three continents. We consult with each other. So when I um, consult with someone in London, that means that I won't get back from that person that day because I start my work day six hours later and they're already packing up to leave. So just to you know, explain a little bit how we work, uh, it's actually a, a lot of work behind the scenes that you probably don't know, um, but we work for you. Um, if we send your paper out, that means we liked it. So there were reasons why we sent it out and there were reasons why we would like to, to help you you know, make it better and make it actually right for, for, for our journal. Uh, most papers, because of all this, require usually two to three uh, uh, rounds of review. I've heard pe people complaining that in other journals, like high, very high profile journals, it takes even more than two to three uh, rounds of review. In, uh, um, I don't want to sound offensive, but I know nature uh, editors and uh, uh, one thing that I really appreciate about them is their vision. Uh, sometimes they send really, really preliminary works, but they feel that there is something really, something there, and they send these preliminary works out. And after maybe a year or more, five rounds of review, they get uh, really a study that's nature quality, and uh, some people perceive that as torture, but... Um, T talking to these uh, editors, I really don't think it is torture. Uh, I think that they actually have something, a, a luxury maybe, or a gift that we uh, perhaps don't have so much, and that is, you know, a vision of, of the paper, where the paper can, can, can be, uh, and uh, what does it need to become a nature study. So, uh, as I said, after we receive um, the, the comments from the uh, referees, we have to reach a decision, and there are several of them, so just to get you familiar with uh, all the options we have, 
Reject is the worst option for the authors. Um, we can reject with an open door saying uh, that's what happened to our molecular cell pipe paper. They told us, oh, we really like your study, but uh, we are aware that it will take you some time to get there, you know, to get to, to uh, respond to all the criticism. So come back when you're ready. We'll be happy to look at it again, um, provided that, this, that someone else didn't actually publish something very similar to your study. So that's what we call OD or open door. Um, we might invite the revision, which is called P and Q. Don't ask me why. Um, so that means we would like to come back in two, three to four months with the revision. Uh, that's really good news. We, mean we are sort of more committed to publishing your paper. And rarely we actually accept the, a paper immediately. It did happen to me. I had one referee saying, I usually have a lot of comments. And I read this paper three times, and I can't find a single thing you know, to, to ask for. This is beautiful. Publish it as it is. So that happens rarely, but it happens. So when you get the comments, uh, this is what we suggest you to do. Please um, don't get the criticism as an insult. It's actually too, uh, really meant to improve your study. Be professional when you, when you respond to this criticism. Most importantly, address all the criticism that you've got. So even if you disagree with the referee and you think that they were way off ba base, just explain. Explain why. And then we'll read that and you know, use our own brain to understand. And then many, many times the uh, uh, authors are right. So just you know, come down and explain why you think uh, an experiment cannot be done, why you think the experiment is actually useless, why you think that the experiment would not add anything to what you have in your story but respond to all the criticism and respond in a professional way. Um, on the other hand, if the experiments that are asked from you are really um, doable and, and important, uh, do, do them. Just you know, don't argue, don't rebut, just do them. Because, and, and often we, uh, we customize, that I do really often, customize the decision letter and I tell you uh, without X and Y we would not reconsider your paper. So you have to do certain things to, to come back to us. Or if I think something's really not that important, and uh, I would tell you that up front. Like uh, if a referee says, um, oh, uh, proving uh, the translational potential of this paper would be great by adding some human data, I might actually say, no, uh, you don't really need any human data to, uh, for us to continue. It would definitely increase the value of your paper. But uh, editorially, we think that that would not be the pre uh, a prerequisite for further consideration of your study. So we do uh, you know, give you some guidance when we send the paper back to you, send the reports back to you. And uh, as I said, we can overrule, overrule referees. And that can be tricky, so we also you know, talk to them. And uh, when everything works fine, we are all reasonable beings, so I, when everything works fine, they also learn where our bar is, so it usually it, it, it's fine. Uh, but the, as I said, it's not just that we read the reports and then, okay, uh, two plus is one minus, so we're going to go, go on with this study. It's, it's more complex. Um, most revisions are seen, again, by the referees, which means not all of them. Uh, when we get your point-by-point -point response, we read it, of course, and then if we told you you must do this and that, and you come back and you do not do it, but you don't really have any good excuse for not doing it, then we won't waste our referees' time by sending this back to them, because it's really a waste of their time. Um, they told you to do certain things. We agree with them. We asked you to do these things. You come back and you say, well, my mice reproduce really poorly, so you know we could not do this. It's really bad, but you know we really need these things to, to, to proceed with your studies. So please complete especially the experiments that we really, really care for. Or uh, if you have any issues like that, I, I advise you to call the editor as soon as the issue arises. And then you can actually talk to the editor and see what can be done. Maybe an alternative can be found. You know, um, Just talk to your editor and uh, don't be shy to email or call. Uh, I think that works really, really well. Not everyone knows that. When I was an author myself, I did not do that. 
Uh, so, as I said, when you respond to referees, uh, don't take the criticism as, a, as an insult. It's an opportunity, actually, to improve your paper and to, uh, sometimes it's just to, to explain yourself better because sometimes the referees or the editors didn't get it because it was not really explained well. Be professional. Uh, do not insult the referees or the, 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 the editors. That won't really get you far. Um, be persuasive and diplomatic, and uh, if something was not understood, that means you need to rewrite it because, you know, it was not understood because it was probably unclear. Um, if you're unhappy with our decision, uh, there is this thing called uh, appeals. You can appeal to our editorial decision. Uh, we used to consider appeals only after re the review process. Now we consider appeals also after first uh, decision. So if we decided not to send your paper out for peer review and you think that was not justifiable, you can actually appeal to our decision and then we will consider it again. We have to, that's, our, that's your right to appeal and it, uh, it's our obligation to consider your paper again. And then, then you will get a really detailed explanation as to why we rejected your paper if uh, our letter was not clear enough or um, we'll agree with you perhaps we missed something and then send it out. But most appeals actually come to us after uh, the decision after peer review. So uh, in some cases it's really reparable, you know, like the novelty is, the, the advance is really uh, small and there is no way that the referees will get more excited about your study. So that, that's sort of useless to, to appeal to. But in some cases, in some cases we reject papers because uh, the, the list of the experiments suggested uh, and that we think are important to be done is just too extensive. And uh, it's sort of better for, for everyone involved. If you want this paper to be published fast, and you don't want to come back to us in a year because we think that the conditional mouse model would be really necessary to prove your point instead of a general knockout that you used in your study, then perhaps you, you would like to submit elsewhere uh, rather than come back. But if you really want to come back, you can appeal, do the experiment first, and then uh, make it easy for us. So um, just uh, write a point-by-point a, a -point response we have to consider your appeal. So if you appeal to us, we will consider it. But in order to be successful, uh, you should uh, actually, uh, okay, so I'm sorry, this, these are the reasons to appeal. If new data becomes available and uh, you actually respond to all the criticism be, uh, that yet you received, this is great. We really love that and a lot of appeals actually uh, come to us. We make it clear to our authors that, you know, uh, in some cases, we don't really see any way to go forward. So, but in many cases, uh, we, we are clear, if you, if you can actually provide uh, these data, uh, then we will be very happy to reconsider your paper. So uh, this is rare, but it can happen. If uh, you think that the uh, referee or referees or editor <coughs> made a factual error, then that's a good reason to appeal. And uh, if you have specific evidence of uh, referee bias, that's also something that we have to consider. I have to say that these are very difficult to, to get, but in, in my uh, career of two years and a half as an editor, I have encountered uh, a couple of them. Uh, these are really bad reasons to appeal. Uh, scientific arguments, a decision based on judgments of novelty or importance are difficult, really difficult to overturn. So if the referees are not excited by your study, and there's really little that we can do. Uh, these are... Uh, strategies, uh, appeal strategies that are really unsuccessful, uh, cosmetic changes. Uh, we get this a lot, uh, really a lot. Do you know who I am? I mean, I've published this and that, and uh, I've presented this work at this conference, and I get this great, uh, you know, response. It's not a good reason to, to appeal. Celebrity endorsement, my paper was read by a Nobel Prize winner and this person told us that this paper is great. So in other words, you don't know what you're doing. So please, you know, send your paper back to the referees. These are uh, rare but do happen. Uh, usually not a good strategy. As well as this. Uh, this, I think, this happens rather, rather uh, frequently, but that's also because people 
perhaps uh, are not aware how fast the field moves. So if you tell me, why did you reject my paper? Uh, a similar study has been published in 2012, and they had exact same elements in, my paper, in their paper. Well, that was four years ago. And the field actually had moved on, so you know, we now our bar is higher. We need more evidence. We need uh, perhaps uh, uh, other techniques that are now gold standard and were not even uh, there in 2012, stuff like that. Um, I, we do get this as well uh, because uh, it's very easy when you're unhappy to blame someone for that, and you know we are actually the first person to blame. So can I have a, another editor to handle my paper because I was really unhappy with the decision? Uh, that's not going to happen. So be nice to your editor. Um, <laughs> And now we are at the acceptance uh, stage. So your paper has been through all the uh, reviewers, uh, I'm sorry, uh, review cycles, and everybody's happy saying this paper now can be published. And then we have to do something. So uh, a nice thing about nature communications, we really don't care in which, in which format you submit your paper. If you had it at nature and it's a letter um, format, just submit it to us. I mean, we don't really care. Um, we will care about the format at the accept stage. And then we will ask you to add certain things to f uh, reformat your paper uh, in line with our general standards. And that's what we call the acceptance in principle. We'll go through your paper, tell you what to do. Um, it's, it's quite simple if you follow it. I have AIP'd one paper seven times, uh, which is really annoying because we spend a lot of time uh, instructing you what you need to change. And these are some you know, uh, changes like your abstract should be only 150 words and you should use present tense when you talk about your own results and stuff like that. So um, you know, we actually give you a lot of guidance, a lot of help to put your, put your manuscript in a, in a shape that will be in line with our uh, general standard. standard. So, after your paper is being accepted, sent to production, um, that takes a lot of time and we're trying to get that uh, down. It usually takes a month, uh, which uh, many people uh, find uh, a little bit too long. We're working on uh, getting that reduced, especially because we are an online paper, online journal, and uh, some of our competitors actually can uh, put online the draft, uh, like two days after. The paper is accepted, so uh, we are aware of, of this, uh, of this uh, issue and we are working on it. But uh, when your paper is finally published, it's really perfect. So that's why it takes uh, a bit longer. Um, at that point, we also can, uh, we, we, we editors write uh, press releases of papers. That's really fun and something that I really like. Um, if you like writing, uh, then you will have a chance to write a, a short article about papers that you published. And these short articles will be published uh, on uh, the Nature site. And uh, the purpose is that the journalists, so people, laymen, so, so you, you, you write it really in, in, in plain, using plain words, not really scientifically um, heavy. So uh, uh, the way you would explain it to, to your friend who is not a scientist. So we, we uh, tend to write these articles in that way. And then journalists pick them up and uh, you know maybe it will end up, my personal success story was a BBC story on, a, on an article that I um, uh, published. Uh, actually it was taken up by I think uh, around 50 uh, different news uh, outlets. Uh, but you know, being uh, someone who grew up with uh, many scientific shows from BBC, that I, I consider that really <laughs> like a highlight of my editorial career. So that's also something that we do, and uh, it's also very nice for the authors. Your your, your work gets more visibility. Um, we also tweet about your papers. Uh, you know, we try to use social network to promote the paper. So uh, that's also on you. You know, you should also do the same. Uh, it sort of uh, increases the visibility of, of your study. Um, recently, we've started at the beginning of this year. We studied transparent peer review uh, in our journal. It's a it's um, a test. Uh, we just got. I was last week in London and we had this big editorial meeting, all Nature Communications editors were there. Uh, so our executive editor told us that the success rate, well actually the rate of people that opted in for this uh, 
transparent peer review is 60%. It's quite successful, and we are planning to continue with it. What, what is it? Uh, we ask you if you want, uh, along with your paper, your uh, referee's comments to be published with your rebuttal, with your point-by-point uh, -point response. And 60% of, of, of authors that submitted their papers in 2016 said yes. So uh, that gives you, uh, that gives everyone basically uh, a better view of what we do, or of what was the process of uh, the peer review process, how it, how it went. And you can actually get the taste of our involvement in, in this process as well, because there, there you will find also some details that you wouldn't uh, normally know how uh, a certain paper was guided through, you know, from the submission to the acceptance. Uh, this is something I would really like to talk to you about, and that's uh, a transfer system that we have in our uh, uh, family of journals. So if you submit your paper to Nature Medicine because you thought it was a good fit, and the editor from Nature Medicine thinks your study is really good, but not really for them, uh, they might uh, consult with us. And uh, of course, uh, when you submit your paper, you will be asked if you want uh, the editors, other editors to be consulted. I think many people do not really know what that means. That, that, that doesn't mean we will breach any confidentiality. It means that if uh, an editor, as I mentioned, in one journal <coughs> thinks your study is really good, but it's not for them, it's clearly not for them, but it would be a good fit for another journal. So a nature um, editor thinks it's a good fit in nature medicine, or a nature medicine uh, editor thinks it's a good fit for nature communications, they will talk to us, but we need your permission to do that. So uh, I think that works really well. We usually have a short ch chat with the, uh, I have uh, several colleagues that work on cardiovascular in nature, nature medicine. Those are the two journals that I collaborate mostly with. Um, the same goes for nature biotechnology and et cetera. So we have this uh, a consultation um, between uh, different journals and it's intended to save you time uh, to find the best home for your paper. Uh, and. Uh, you can opt in or opt out at the submission, but if you opt in, uh, there are several uh, ways that your paper can be transferred. So sometimes the editors from uh, a journal where your paper is being rejected think that the paper is a good fit for another journal, but they haven't consulted with the editors from their journal, and that's not committal PS. So they, they clearly say, uh, we think that they might be interested, but we did not consult with them, so it might, hap might not happen. But uh, usually the editors from uh, different journals know um, the bar of other journals, so this usually works really well. This is something when, uh, when an editor of a certain journal gets really excited about the study, but they know it's just not for them, and then they c reach out to us and consult with us, and I, I really don't remember when I said no, because usually we get really good, good papers this way, and everyone's happy. Uh, this is, I think, even, even more useful, because if your paper has been reviewed uh, in any nature family uh, journal, and uh, then rejected based on the reports, but again, uh, the editor sees value in your study, say. Uh, you didn't reach, uh, you didn't decipher the mechanism well enough. And that's a must for nature. But it, it's not going to be a problem for us because, you know, with what you have in your paper, that's an immediate accept. So they send us, uh, if you, of, of course, say yes uh, to this uh, uh, consultation uh, option, uh, the, the editor uh, in charge will send us uh, all the comments, the paper, explain the situation, we will consult with each other, and uh, in many, many cases we will uh, invite the submission and say, we don't require any additional experiments, uh, please tone down or change this or change that, and we will accept your paper in principle. Or uh, we'll say, um, even though it would be great if you added X, Y, Z, we don't really need it to proceed, but we need you to do uh, ABC. So when you transfer your paper, uh, we will also instruct our referees, once you do the experiments required, that that's the only thing we care, care for. And as long as you do these experiments and they're technically sound, it's fine with us. So I think that's very, very useful for, and our authors actually like this, because it, it shortens the time. You know, your paper has been already reviewed. You don't really need to do anything but to click uh, this button to transfer the paper to, to us. So that would be it.
Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me or talk to me today. This is my email. Um, quite long, but what can I say? Um, and um, for those who are perhaps uh, looking for a um, uh, different career, we are hiring. As I said, we have to reach this magical number 100 editors. So, you know, just um, keep a close uh, eye on uh, our ads. So, you know, and uh, apply if you're interested. Uh, I can tell you that the, the people that I work are really, really nice. And uh, the journal is actually, we, we do work a lot. Don't expect nine to five. That's not going to happen. Um, we travel a lot, uh, but we really like each other and we like what we do. So if that sounds interesting, we have ads quite often. Thank you. Grazie.